Welcome to this evening's program, Men in the Making, Domestic Sex Trafficking and the Male Buyer. I am Debbie Wiedinghoff, President of the National Council of Jewish Women, Chicago North Shore Section. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight we are partnering with the Her Story Theater to give you a unique look at sex trafficking. Please note that everyone will be muted to minimize any feedback noise. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat. JCAST, the Jewish Community Against Sex Trafficking, founded in 2013 is a program of NCJW Chicago North Shore. JCAST was created to educate and engage those in Chicago and surrounding communities in tra sex trafficking prevention. JCAST is committed to ensuring that everyone can live a life free from coercion, violence, and exploitation. JCAST falls under the leadership of NCJW Director of Violence Against Women Initiatives, Sherry Petlin. Raise your hand. Sherry also oversees Luggage for Freedom, Traffic Teens, uh, Silent Witness, and Court Watch. To learn more about these programs, as well as JCAST, please visit our website at ncjwcns.org. If at any time you find tonight's presentation overwhelming or triggering, please do not hesitate to leave the Zoom room. Your well-being always comes first. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's presenters, Gail Nelson, Engagement and Development Director of JCAST, and Kathy Carmody, NCJW Life Member and a JCAST Steering Committee Member. And now I will turn the evening over to Kathy. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Terrific. And uh, I guess um, we didn't add for you, Debbie, to introduce Mary Bonnet, who will uh, talk about it, where is she? Can she raise her hand or her hat? Or mm -hmm. there she is, uh, a playwright uh, and um, 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 leader of Her Story Theater and Ryan Spooner from Case. He will uh, also add a perspective about educating uh, boys because as you know, tonight, we're gonna spend more time talking about the men uh, than we have in our, our prior few sessions. So uh, what I'm going to do is pull up the PowerPoint, but I'll, and I'll remind you when, before we start the um, presentation uh, of the performance, that what we're going to do at that point, we're gonna ask you all to turn off your sound, uh, which is off pretty much anyway, uh, but also your video so that we're not looking at you the only thing that we're going to be able to see then is the performer. And um, uh, before we start, we'll have you uh, enlarge. We, we can help you figure out how to do that if you need to, but make sure you enlarge the one picture of the performer so that you can see and hear her because we don't, we don't want to have any tech difficulties before we get started. Any questions about that? Okay, cool. So... Here's what we will do. We will go into uh, share mode. Okay. Go into share mode and then I will pull it up. Share screen. There's never, never really a good way to do this, in my opinion, but I didn't, I didn't make the technologies. Here we go, here we go. Okay, great, thank you. So um, as you can see, we've got three logos up there. We've got JCast, we've got Her Story Theater, and we've got Case. And so what we're going to be doing this evening is um, combining a performance of part of a play that many, uh, I recognize some names there. Many of you may have seen this play uh, when we went down uh, to view it in 2018, I think it was, Monger. And so Jamise is going to, uh, who's the actor, she's going to uh, perform. And then we're gonna have a post-performance conversation with Mary and Ryan and, and Gail and I will pitch in, uh, be able to watch the chat as needed. So of course, welcome. We'll tell you a little bit about the play Monger. You'll see the performance. We'll spend a few minutes also talking about the performance afterwards. It can be very powerful. and. I don't know how many of you have 
during the pandemic actually participated in online performance. At first, it's kind of strange, but we, uh, my husband and I, for instance, uh, watched some Northlight performances and it's really immediate because it's only the two of you right or the one of you and so unlike being in a theater there's a, a different impact so we'll talk about that a little bit and then uh mary and ryan will discuss what they know about sex trafficking and the male buyer especially because mary's been doing some research and interviewing as she writes her plays <clears throat> and uh they ha she had a great way of talking about it, which is how did, how the heck did we get to a place of devaluing females as if they were products to be purchased online, like a pizza. And we'll see that in fact, that's, that's somewhat how it works. So then we'll, we can have a Q and A, we can also have Q and A while, uh, you know, feel free to put some questions in the chat if you have them. For those of you who don't know who JCAST is, we are an initiative of uh, National Council of Jewish Women, Chicago North Shore section. NCJW has been around since 1893. It's based in Washington, D.C., does a lot of advocacy work in terms of uh, community, uh, women's issues, family issues, voting issues, education and community service is how we focus here as well in Chicago. Uh, JCAST itself began in 2013. We've got we did some programs this winter that I think some of you may have attended. And you can look at those on YouTube if, I mean, it's pretty cool. We've got a YouTube channel and you can find us there. Here's uh, Ryan's picture from his, uh, pay, uh, his webpage. Uh, he'll tell you a little bit about himself uh, later if he wants, or you can chime in now, Ryan, if you want. But he's basically one of the guys who goes around to the high schools from Case and works in prevention education to help uh, young people understand about sexual harm and exploitation and, and the other side of that, which would be healthy relationships, racial justice, and those issues that really come to the fore when we talk about exploitation. And I, I imagine most of you have heard of CASE, the very well-known organization in Chicago. Her story theater, uh, Mary's intent here is to shine bright lights in dark places on women and children in need of social justice and community support. And she's been writing plays on all sorts of issues uh, along the way. She's the uh, producing artistic director. You'll see tonight that she's uh, quite a researcher and has interviewed some of the buyers as we would call them. Uh, and also any play that she writes, she grounds it in the realities of the issue that she's writing about. And then in the spring, she's got a new one coming out that we're looking forward to seeing called MIA, which I guess means missing in action, where have all the young girls gone? So she's also progressing in, in the way she talks about and approaches uh, the issues. So Monger, also known as the awakening of J.B. Benton, she wrote it. Uh, we saw it. How many? I can't really see too many hands, but how many of you went with us in 2018 to see that? Can you see, Gail, if there's any hands coming up? It, it was very powerful. We also had a post play discussion after that. And it's uh, maybe Mary will explain a little bit of it, but it's a, it's about a guy who's also a dad, who's what we also call a hobbyist. And we'll explain that. So a hobbyist or a monger is a guy, mongers give tips to one another on purchasing women wherever they are. So in their own hometowns or if they go elsewhere and they want to purchase someone for sex, they give them tips on doing that. And now a lot of that can be done and is done online. They live in every community, including ours. Anything you wanna add yet, Mary? Oh yeah, I have quite a bit to add. Okay, so <laughs> a little uh, background. Do you want you want to, You'll do it afterwards, though, right? Oh, I'd like to do a little intro so they have a, a reference to what's going on here, and I think it'll all play into the big picture. Okay, so do you want to do that now while they're looking at? So let me. One other thing I'll say then is, so you know when you go to the theater live and you look at the playbill, and you see those great pictures of the actors. Well, that's 
Jamisa's cool picture that you would see in the playbill. And this is the dialogue, this, this is what's written about her that you see on the slide. So you can see her background there, maybe while everybody's looking at that, Mary, you wanna um, say a little yeah. bit, because then what we'll do is we'll have her, uh, I guess I'll give the cue in a good theatrical, as good a theatrical form as I can. And then, uh, but first we'll have you all um, mute yourselves and uh, stop your video, but go ahead, Mary. Okay, great. Um, I followed the Mongers, it's an online community, as Kathy said, for about a year and a half on this specific website. And I just wanna weave some of the threads together so you get a picture of how everything, this, this play plays in together. Uh, there are junior and senior Mongers, and if you're living in Detroit, you can get online and you can ask, I need this particular type of service or female in Glenview. You go to the Illinois site and who do you have? So the senior mongers will private message you and give you uh, all that information. There's about a hundred or more threads on there from fetishes to sexual addiction. And some of the favorite threads are the Asian or the European massage parlors. And the European massage parlors are usually the Ukrainian women and there was an incident where Monger came out of was an interview with the trial judge who his first case of trafficking was a pimp that was on trial. It was a big case. And a, a Ukrainian woman had escaped. She had been uh, tattooed with a, um, his man, the pimp's manifesto on her back as were the others. Uh, she'd been abused and deprived. Now this was in the Northern suburbs. This was in a strip mall. So no, the, the, and it was in your neighborhood. And uh, he was married with two kids, the pimp. So uh, anyway, the judge took this on and there was a prosecuting attorney that was involved as, as there were many. And when the victim got on the stand, she singled out one of the prosecuting attorneys and said, identified him as a customer. And of course he denied it. They, um, they ran it through his credit card. He had indeed used that massage parlor and he had had additional payments. And he said, oh, it was a grift gift for her great services. Well, it turned out it was a gift for happy endings that she had given him for sexual gratification. And the lawyer was kicked off the case and uh, these committees, he lost his job, he lost his wife, and he lost certainly the respect of the community, but he was not disbarred. The pimp got 150 years. Switch over to Jamisa's character that she's doing today, the character of Ruth Echt, Edwards was a fictionalized character, but based on uh, an actual incident that happened in Chicago on the South Side. Um, and it was, uh, I knew the mother who it happened to, and I knew the cousin, and I knew some of the students who knew the victim. And out of that, and it was a 16 year old girl, and out of that came, that victim, came the FOSTA SESTA Act, which shut down these, um, is Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act and shut down these websites. And one of those websites was the Mongers website. And uh, I followed that and they went nuts. They went over to an automotive uh, site on Facebook and they whined and they complained like a leg had been amputated. And they said, don't worry, we'll be back in two weeks. And in fact, they were back in three months and they reopened in Turkey. So the monologue uh, came from uh, this mother's experience um, and there's irony to it because when the, when the FOSTA SESTA Act was passed, Trump signed it and he handed the pin over to this mother. And it was hard to watch. It was extremely ironic. And then anyway, um, this is the mother's response to the loss of her sex traffic daughter as she talks to an attorney on the video conference call. And he's interviewing her to see if she's fit to testify uh, in support of her daughter. Okay, that's Sorry. a great setup. So now here's what I want y'all to do. Please turn off your video. So go to where it says, um, uh, I guess stop video, right? But you'll still be able to hear. So everybody's off but me. And then we want you to mute and it looks like everybody is muted. And I, I will mute as soon as, as I give the cue, which I will now do. And, and uh, by the way, uh, if you wanna take some notes uh, to be prepared to ask some questions or uh, afterwards, feel free to do that. And I think uh, Jamise is going to stay around so we can always ask questions. 
And now, Jamise Wright in the product from the play Monger, written by Mary Bonnet. Can, can you hear me? Uh, is my mic working? Yes? Good. My name is Ruth Edwards. I'm the mother of Diamond Jones. My address is, <laughs> you know, I, I can't remember. We moved because, because of the mess and um, I don't remember my new address. If I get cut off from the video, Mr. Ben, could I please get your phone number? 312-805-2280. Thank you. My child, Diamond, she was a beautiful child and young woman. She talked nonstop and had womanly opinions on everything. But she still loved Hello Kitty and the color pink. I wore pink today in honor of my daughter. Every bit of clothing in my daughter's closet is pink. How am I feeling? Uh, Mr. Ben, I haven't felt anything since the night that officer walked, knocked at my door. Miss Edwards? Ruth Edwards? Yes? I remember his eyes. The care had faded. I can't remember my own address, but I remember his badge number. 6284, badge number 6284 was a shiny bright star. It reminded me of my child when she was four years old, just four. And we were standing out in the backyard on one of those rare nights when the clouds lift and the stars come out to shine. I said, look, Diamond, isn't that you up there twinkling and shining so bright? Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. <laughs> oh, my diamond loved that song. But then she, she'd lift her arms up and say, pick me up, mama. <laughs> her high demanded pitch voice. Hiya, mama, hiya. <laughs> oh, and then she laughed and we'd sing together. She was a chubby little toddler. <laughs> but I held her as high and as long as I could, just so I could feel her joy and love run through me. Even when my arms weakened, I didn't want to let her down. I looked at that officer's star and I realized my mistake. I let her down. That's why he was standing at my door. I let her down. Miss Edwards, I'm sorry to inform you, but your daughter, he paused long enough to prepare me for the amputation. Your daughter, was found dead in a garage in Markham, Illinois at 8.34 this morning, December 24th. I woke up on my porch in the arms of a woman in blue. Her eyes were shiny and moist. She helped raise me from the floor and face that day. The paramedics, Yes, the paramedics, I remember them arriving. They were kind and handsome men, good men, men to protect us. I'm sorry, I need a moment. <sighs> Mr. 
Yes, I know where I left off. I left off not paying attention to my baby. I left off not doing the right thing for my child. I left off not caring about my baby's feelings because mine were more important. Because I knew more than she did. That's where I left off. So many times in places where I left off and didn't finish the story in the right place. So the story finished me. Why was she in a garage in Markham, Illinois on the day before Christmas? My daughter lives in Chicago. She lives with me, she lives with her father. She has two homes. Do you know a man by the name of Robert Leon, 35 years old? No, I don't, officer. Do you know a man by the name of Dante Mishner, 38 years old? No, I don't. Do you know a man by the name of Demeter Butler, 28 years old? No, I don't, officer, why? They all led her to that garage in Markham. Demeter Butler, looked on the internet for someone young and needy, and he found my baby girl. He wooed her. 28 year old man twisting her mind. Demita Butler, this aide to the devil, showed up in a busted out car. He was an oily looking, skinny, tattooed, droopy pants punk who made her feel important and most of all loved. She had barely finished playing with dolls and he already had her playing house until the devil arrived. Devil comes in many shapes, don't they, Mr. Benton? This devil's name was Dante Deceiver Mitchman. Isn't that a fitting name for a man who buys and sells little girls? He sold my daughter to a man in Markham. Dante Deceiver Mitchner was 6'6 six, six and weighed 350 pounds. My diamond was 5'1 and weighed 110 pounds. What she died from, officer? The cold? His voice, so loud, so clear. Miss Edwards, Robert Leon beat your daughter, stripped her naked, strangled her and, and slit her throat and left her to bleed out on a garage floor. He lives with his mother and father. Satan has a mother who loves him. The paramedics walked me into my home and laid me on my couch. Miss Edwards, your daughter was sold to this man for sex. <laughs> this is a prank. <laughs> my cousin Marcus sent you over here because I didn't invite him to Christmas dinner. <laughs> he eats too much. There's never enough for the rest of us. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> He sent you over here, didn't he? Always messing with me. <laughs> no. Well, then I'm afraid you've got the wrong address, officer. Because my 16-year-old daughter is in history class learning. She's not laying on that dirty garage floor, bleeding thick and sticky. No, she is dressed and she's going to college and she's going to law school. She's a lawyer and she's taking care of me at my old age. 
I danced at her wedding and my grandbabies are the grandest. One of them is named Ruth. Now you get the fuck out of my house with your filthy fucking lies. You liars, you're all liars. Get the fuck out of my house. Get the fuck out of my house. Rock it on Christmas with your lies. Get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> Five tranquilizers and a bottle of bourbon later, I identified her body at the morgue. That little 110 pound light skinned baby girl had the markings of a big man's fist all over her body. Fists that painted her in blues and reds and yellows and purples with lumps the sizes of melons. I couldn't recognize my daughter. How could I? Crusty old blood like African war paint coating her beautiful soft skin. She was the color of the universe until Satan got a hold of her. I'd never been in a morgue. It's cold, it lacks light. There's this sweet, putrid stench of death and bleach filling the air. The only thing I remember were the metal wheels creaking across the cement floor and the unzipping of this plastic bag to reveal this small, naked creature. Silent, so silent. I kept watching, waiting for an, an eye twitch, a finger flick. I knew she couldn't hold that pose much longer without shivering from the cold metal beneath her. Is that your daughter, Miss Edwards? No. Isn't that Diamond Jones, your daughter, Miss Edwards? No. That is a statue. It's cold to touch, it's hard as rock. What kind of daughter is that? My daughter is warm and soft and smells like lavender. This statue won't smile or laugh or hug me. My daughter did all of those things. So no, this is not my daughter. Are you crazy? That's how people act when they're dead, Miss Edwards. Oh. Well, in that case, yes. Because my alive daughter would never act like that. In that moment, I realized a war had descended upon my baby girl's body. And who are the leaders of this war? Hmm. Who are the co-conspirators? Who put on the road to Markham? Men. A man killed her because he wanted to use her body for sex. A man sold her in an ad that read new, hot, young thing so that he could live off of her body. Another man gave her away to a seller for a $250 finder's fee to make use of her body. Click, click, click. My daughter looks for love on the internet. We didn't know love was looking for her too. Sizing up her marketability, profiling her sales value, taking inventory in her assets and quantifying her debits. 
We assumed she was safe in her room and we were wrong. My baby was amputated from me by grown men, a man whose rage still not quenched from beating, raping and strangling my child decided he needed to slit her throat, leaving her to die in a pool of blood staining his own mother's garage floor. My baby must have yelled something like, pay up or fuck off. <laughs> My little woman child, so tough. Pimp waiting in the car. He'd take care of her. She trusted. Isn't that the way? Kids trust. Little girls trust. This killer who had known her so intimately had been inside of her who had felt her sweet breath her warmth her youth decided she needed to die because this thing he bought this product he purchased wasn't acting properly it was wasn't working right and it upset him and he called her a um <laughs> a vacuum he called her a vacuum. And when that vacuum stopped working the way that he wanted it to, he destroyed it. And that's how some men are. They see girls' bodies as, as things, as products that they can just buy and then use up and then throw away and toss back in the store whenever it stops working properly. You ever done that, Mr. Benton? Seen little girls' bodies like products, like things, like young, hot things, like a car you can take for a spin or a vacuum cleaner with good suction. You know, I asked myself, who are these co-conspirators buying up these little girls' bodies like toilet paper off a shelf? What kind of men would do that? I've never met a man who bought a little girl for sex. Never thought of what one would look like until, until I met you. Because if you look at this list, and my daughter's phone from the night that she was a vacuum. There's a number you might recognize. 312-805-2280. Isn't that your number, Mr. Benton? The number you just gave me to call you? And here's something else you might recognize. The vacuum, my daughter. That number, your number, that exact number was in my child's cell phone. You have talked to my baby, Mr. Ben. You have met with my baby. You have lain with my baby. Two weeks before she was murdered, you bought my baby's body for your pleasure. She was recommended by a fellow hobbyist. At least that's what the police officers think. What they know, thanks to your prepaid untrackable cell phone, is that you prepaid to have sex with my child. You thought my daughter was expensive, Mr. Benton? You have no idea how much her mother is going to cost you. Think your marriage your career, your reputation, your freedom. It is a crime to have sex with a child, Mr. Benton. My diamond was a child, not a woman, not a thing, not a product, not a vacuum. She was my little girl and you men took her from me. 
You perform the amputation. You are a co-conspirator in the war and death on my child's body. And I'm just as responsible as the man who slit her throat. Before your participation in this crime, here is my wish. Every time you witness a night sky, and you see a star twinkling up above you, know that that's my diamond staring down back at you, living out her four-year-old dreams. Cause all her dreams bled out on that cold cement floor in Markham, Illinois, along with mine. Wow. How does how do we applaud? Yeah, how do we applaud here? Great job. That was terrific. <laughs> Killed it. <Thank> you. <laughs> oh my god. Wow. Really exhausting. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that was terrific. Thank you. <laughs> wow. So uh, thank you for doing that and performing for us. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so uh, what I'm going to do now is ask people in the audience for some, put some words in the chat if, if they want about uh, what, what sort of three words come to mind for you all who watch that after watching the performance and then everybody can see them and we can cascade some of your responses um, to, uh, to what you saw. And I, it, yeah, heartbreaking. I mean, it's, uh, it was, for me, for me, it was like, because uh, I'm here watching, looking in your eyes, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it's just really powerful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard piece. It's a really hard piece, but I, I enjoy doing it because I think it's very important for the message that it's sending. Right, and that's why we have um, you know, events like this now is to take something like that and that makes it uh, more than visceral, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then we can talk about the pieces in it that Mary's built in that were so great in the language and um, the specifics about product and demand and some of the things that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was fantastic. And, and uh, so you're gonna stick around, right? Yes, I will be here. I okay, here. that's great. So let me also ask for, for those of you who might've been in, um, um, in any of our uh, programs this winter, what, uh, anybody wanna share their thoughts verbally so you can come off of uh, mute if you like or raise your hand. Anybody wanna share your thoughts about how this monologue relates to how buying sex with minors impacts our lives and our communities? Anybody wanna make a comment, a little feedback before we get started into the, uh, Go back to the intellectual PowerPoint piece. Anybody? Any, any other chat comments? What I love about this piece is, is, you, is the way that they, they, they tie in the attorney's cell phone into it and um, pulling that piece of, of, of it all, you know, that we, again, you know, we don't, the person, the people that are buying, that are buying these, these young, beautiful children um, are right here, are right around us. So Jamise, can you see Jill's uh, question? Her question is she wants to hear from you. Uh, how does it compare doing this Zoom thing for, uh, from being on the stage. 
Yeah, um, it's very different. This is actually my first official like Zoom performance that I've ever done. Okay. Um, so, so it's very different um, having to like focus in on the camera because it, again, it only feels like there's one person there looking at you at a time. Um, it's a little bit more nerve wracking than it is being on stage because at least on stage, you can't really see out there, but you at least get like audience feedback. Sometimes they gasp, sometimes they, they clap or they laugh. Um, and here you just kind of have to just go through the piece and hope that it, you know, translates and that it hits well. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a fun experience. I did enjoy it. I thought I found the, the positive things in it while I was doing it. Well, clearly you're very skilled because even it looked like you were crying from, you know, so I mean, you. I was. I was. <laughs> it took me a second to get that right. But I was like, I'm going to cry on this thing. It was the last thing I do. <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. laughs> All right. So we've got another um, 45 minutes. You can decompress from this. Uh, I will. Uh, uh, I just uh, think it was great. And if hopefully you'll get a chance and maybe we'll do an event next spring then with Mary about the next play. So everybody can go see that one as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pull up, share screen again and uh, find my PowerPoint and go back to that. And uh I assume you all can see that. So uh, this is uh, just this was a slide for me to cue questions to you all. Uh, feel free to again uh, if you've got questions, raise your hand. If um, if you want to put something in a chat, you can do that. So what we're going to do uh, for the rest of the time is uh, review some. Uh, information about sex trafficking, some of which some of you may have seen before. And um, then Mary's going to go into some of her research about uh, cultural and uh, um, masculine hegemony and its relation, their relationship to sex trafficking, as I think you'll find that very interesting. And then Ryan's going to talk about how case supports educating males and that, you know, they can go back and forth uh, depending on on what they say and and we can have a conversation around that. So again, feel free to put into the chat any questions you have or feel free to ask questions uh, later during the Q&A. And let's figure out, oops, there we go. So we'll start again with the definition of human trafficking. And as most of you know, at JCAST and NCJW, we think of, of sex trafficking as slavery and as a business. It's what we call the MBA of domestic violence. It's a 99 of the $150 billion of human trafficking is sex trafficking. And yet we need, we need to have some common definition. So we use the, the federal definition, which is recruitment and transportation of pers for persons by force, literally force, or fraud, including sham marriages or coercion, which uh, includes anything from threatening somebody that uh, they'll give them away to the authorities if they don't uh, perform what uh, the trafficker wants. And this is all in service of economic exploitation and it's to profit from the prostitution of a person. So this really isn't about sex as much as it is about power and economics. Some of you may have seen this before. When we think about it, it's almost like um, some kind of seesaw or balance. Uh, there's uh, an equation, there's the trafficked, and then there's the buyers. And now Mary's given us some information that the average age of, I think we used to say it was 14, now it's considered to be 13 for the women who are trafficked and 99% of the trafficked in sex trafficking are, are women and young girls. Um, I think that the survival sex piece uh, might be interested for you because if a, if a child is kicked out of his or her house, the reason it's called survival sex is because how else are they gonna live? So in order to get any kind of money, uh, they end up 
being trafficked within 48 hours, a third of them, because the, the traffickers know where to go. They know where to go to find these young, young people. And they lure them in like um, Ms. Edwards was talking about her daughter. And so the survival sex becomes literally that. In terms of the buyers, most of them have a regular partner, like uh, the character in the play, married, right? They have college, they're lawyers. 72% of the buyers of minors are white. 52% of the buyers of adults are white. So this is a, a very um, ethnic interesting, in, in my opinion, ethnic interesting activity. And we'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a minute. And, and I could jump in, Kathy. Yeah, sure. The, the, as, as you talk about in the slide, the average age of those being trafficked is 13, which is similar to what Ms. Edwards was talking about. And of course, in those situations when the young person is underage, you don't need to prove the forced fraud or coercion. Just the, the fact that they were forced to have sex uh, makes them uh, uh, trafficked. Yeah, thanks. I, I forgot to mention that, Gail. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's very important. That uh, underage piece is, is really important. So that's um, a part of who's being trafficked. Again, now we have more information about this in terms of victims by race. So more than half of them are African-American and th the, in this case, the, the N, the number is relatively small for this population, but the numbers that Mary talks about, majority of the women are African-American and they're LGBTQ, they've been isolated or disengaged from their families to be lured away, often foster care, uh, girls in foster care are very much at risk. And, um, you know, you can say that uh, the, in terms of the illicit uh, massage parlors, the majority of those victims actually are from China. So you think about what was going on in Atlanta recently with the Asian community. That's very common in the way uh, the sex trafficking system works. But tonight we're focusing this time on the men. So that's, that's part of the information that, that we've talked about when we talk about the victims and the system. But tonight we're gonna to be talking about the men. So who are these buyers? We never talked about the fact of their professions. I don't know if any of you find it interesting, I certainly do, uh, being married to an IT guy or a former IT guy, that information technology is one of the largest professions out of the 373 of the arrested buyers in this population. Construction, professional business services makes up, uh, all those, those three make up more than half. It, it seems reasonable, right? That the unemployed don't have a lot of discretionary income, so they may not be a large population. But everybody, there, I can't think of a profession that's not on that chart somewhere. And then in one, uh, um, Mary gave us a quote from uh, one of the buyers in this group from Seattle, who said, uh, you know, I know we all like to talk about how much we care and want to protect the girls, but the truth is what we want to protect is our access to the girls. If we really cared about their safety to the extent some claim, we would take all our hobby money and buy them plane tickets home. So there's the word hobby again. For a lot of the men, you know, a lot of folks, when they have discretionary income, they play golf, they go skiing. For these men, they buy sex. Where do they do this? Well, now they do it online. And um, I went into uh, Rub, it's Rub Map, literally called Rub Map. And I found my hometown Morton Grove page and I just took a screenshot of it so you could see it. And I recognize those storefronts. I remember thinking, why would someone need a whole storefront for a foot massage when I first saw it? Well, you know, maybe they do have legit foot massages in there because they take credit cards, whereas everybody else is pretty much cash only. But the point is they can go anywhere practically in the world and go online and find 
what they're looking for. If you notice the newest review, it says is one year ago. So maybe Morton Grove isn't as popular as let's say Skokie, which has more or Evanston or Northbrook has 11 of them. Um, so the, uh, and the other thing is if you really wanna go get those reviews, when I click on that, you have to pay for it. So that's partly where they make the money is to be able to really find the details about the girls. You can go into, this screenshot isn't as great, but you can go in and look in all the different suburbs, you can find the parlor, you can find all the different, basically chat rooms that the men have about the girls. And not only that, now 70% of the recruitment of these girls is online. Which really um, goes back to the economics of this, right? And what we call the demand triangle. So we'll spend time talking about the demand because part of our approach is that if we can reduce demand, then we can reduce sex trafficking. If you think about in the, in the monologue that uh, for Ms. Edwards, she used the word product, right? So product are the girls. And she used the word toilet paper, which was sort of how I was thinking about this during the pandemic, right? Uh, when the things got scarce, the price goes up. So the product in this case are the girls. The trafficker is the organization, whether it's one person or a group of them who lure and find the girls. And the buyer is the consumer. And it's this demand triangle that maintains this process of sex trafficking. So Mary's going to talk now about what it is that enables this to this whole culture to exist in in the U.S. Take it away, Mary. And Mary, okay. there was there was a couple of questions to kind of jump in about your thoughts about how you wrote this scene, um, and how she, and, and about the emotions that were and talking about how the, the emotions were just so raw and believable. And then I hope Brian, you can talk a little bit about what this looks like in regards to the pandemic. Go ahead, Mary. Um, well, I'll, I'll go to the first question, which was, um, you know, how did we get here? How can we order these little girls online like pizza? Um, one of the things that a group of, you know, set together and brainstormed on this, it became clear that it's our culture that breeds this. And uh, I think called cultural hegemony. And that's the domination of a, of a div culturally diverse society by a ruling class. So say if you look at those jobs and those are pretty high-end jobs, who's buying? Um, and we see you know, the Jeffrey Epstein's of the world. Uh, that, that's the kind of crowd that's kind of running America. And it's based on, uh, it's manipulating the society to accept these set of beliefs and values and mores. And if it's, uh, culturally a masculine hegemonic society, then we are accepting that men are dominant in position and that the rest of the population is um, subordinate and that we take on, uh, they're selling us the idea that manhood is idealized, men is the breadwinner, they're natural, they're tough, uh, they're rich and socially sustained. And uh, yes, we do have a brutal and violent um, system and that's 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 as it should be as guns and domestic violence that's as it should be and we've pretty much bought into that uh, because it's been in uh, it's been in place for so many years and you see a lot of people fighting against it black lives matters uh, me too movement they're fighting they're fighting they're fighting to chip that status quo but it lets it glide a little bit and then they come right back in and, and settle it in there saying this is how you must think this is the truth. And it's an artificial truth. It's not the truth. It's an artificial truth that's been imposed on us. So that guns are a priority in our United States and the inferiority of women and the use of them as sexual, for sexual purposes is taken for granted. We see it incessantly in movies and film and music and of course, and our porn that's expanded that's worth two Googles and a couple of uh, uh, 
other uh, massive worldwide websites. Um, they're, they're monstrous. The porn is monstrous. And it's free. A lot of it is free. A couple of the websites are uh, free that any little child could go on. So this is now becoming part of the society that the children are being influenced by that. Strip clubs, you drive by, see gentlemen's club, all the euphemisms that are used. Um, the chat rooms. And this all leads to domestic, the acceptance of domestic sex trafficking. Well, of course, because men, boys will be boys. What harm does it do? We're hobbyists. And, and this website of these mongers really supports all those theories, all that backing. They sit there and they jibber jabber back and forth to one another about their threads, but they support each other in um, this ideology that men are superior and women are there as products to be, to be bought. And um, it's led to, I think, just a, a brutal society to live in. It's accelerated as you see. I started in 2012 on trafficking was just openly coming to Chicago and now it's just exploded. Yes, and yes, it's the internet. And so 97% of the buyers are men. And if they're running the country, if they're making all the, you know, the values that we're buying, it's like having the foxes guard the chicken house. You know, those chickens are gonna get eaten. There's no doubt, it's, you know, and the foxes are going move along, nothing happening here. You know, it's, it is a lot happening there. So now they're targeting the younger, the younger, the younger, and uh, you've got the vulnerable in society with um, little girls who uh, run away. I guess it's one in seven now who on the, hot, uh, the hotline of runaways, they're being, they end up in sex trafficking, one in seven kids that run away. That's a lot. And I think that was out of 25,000 kids that they had identified. So that's substantial. And so now the children are suffering horribly for that. And um, so if we start to identify that, we really start to see it and, and won't be shy of speaking up about it. We as women, we as other men. I mean, it's not a huge population of men that buy, it's percentage wise, but it is a, uh, enough, you know, because it's in the millions that it generates a $99 billion business worldwide. Oh, you can't see me? Hi. <laughs> and uh, so that's, um, sure. and the other two questions were what? Gail, what were those questions? So oh, the question was talking about uh, what, what this, what you, what you thought about. I'd like to hear Mary's thoughts about how she came to write this scene. It, it is to me how she got the emotions so believable. That's oh, question. yeah, I think, well, I interviewed a lot of, I've interviewed probably, I don't know, over maybe 200 women who were trafficked. And um, I just did a grouping in 2012, right before COVID hit at the Haymarket Center. And it was a mix of young women and there's 16, most of them are pregnant. And then the others were older women who'd been on those streets and been trafficked at a young age. And just hearing what they went through and then uh, reading, I, I, a part of it was imagining what it would be like to lose your child under those circumstances and the journey that those women must have gone through who have lost children. And so, so part of it came from that research as well. Um, and then just as a writer, putting myself in her shoes, a lot of that was that. And then just knowing also the research on the story itself, which was based in truth. You know, those, there was, I met, the, I saw the pimp, I went to uh, court and he stood six, six and he was, he could have played for the Chicago bears. He was massive. And I got to see him here, the, uh, that he couldn't get bailed because the little guy, the 28 year old who had originally uh, propositioned her on Facebook said, I'm your boyfriend, come move in with me. And she did and who then sold her to this pen for $250, which he never got paid for. Uh, he turned state evidence in, so he, he plea bargained and he got seven years as opposed to 14. And so the pimp got 17, ended up with 17 years and the, the buyer got, or the um, fee finder got seven. And then uh, the 
I think they're still in court with the other one. I couldn't interview the mother because of that. They were in court, but they had all the, um, I knew the cousin and I was able to talk to her. I was able to talk to some of the high school friends that knew this girl and actually a, a teacher's aide that knew this child and knew the family. And then, um, so there were a lot of different elements coming together to for me. And then I got to meet the family and I got to see their reaction as they sat in court watching this horror show. So God bless them. So and, very strong. And many of us, and many of us heard her speak as well because she was at the Northbrook Library uh, as part of an event that, that NCAA. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not bringing up her name because it is a uh, still on trial, a court thing. So I prefer to stay away from the identifying her just for her own sake. You know, it's so painful. But um, yeah, the murderer, I don't think he's gone to trial yet. So I don't know. They're letting him sit and stew in jail. Can you can you talk about the hegemonic masculinity, this the difference between that and like toxic masculinity? Well, it generates toxic masculinity, which is um, so it, it you know, that uh, everything macho is good. Violence, male domination, you know, calling women names. Uh, don't be a wuss, you know, don't be a pussy. Uh, the term bitch, you hear that so often. I just as a side note, I had interviewed a woman who'd been trafficked. She was a beautiful little girl, 19. And um, I said, you know, she'd just given her story. It was quite profound. And I said, is there anything else you'd like to share that just really, that may have bothered you beyond the obvious? And she uh, said, yes, I hated being called bitch. And I naively said, do you ever ask your pimp not to call you that? And uh, she said, yes. And I said, what are you saying? She says, shut up, bitch. You know, so that was her identity. And they steal your identity. They change your name. They kind of reduce you to dirt under their feet. That's the game to, to reduce you so they can control you. I mean, it's the game. It's not, it's what they know they can do to keep you in check. And um, it's the business. But that was, she hated bitch. And now we hear that all, we have women calling each other bitch until, you know, just, and so if anything, I would stop that word yeah. being used. Can, so we, demeaning. can we bring in Ryan here and um, have yes, him men, talk about men, men. the, yeah, talk about the issue with, um, uh, with the, um, let me see here, with the children again, uh, as, uh, there we go as he talks about um, what they do at CASE and how they're working to, to stop this. Yeah, for sure, I can jump in. Um, there was a question before that, that I think um, Gail mentioned from the chat that I wanted to, to respond to with um, really not, not actually a full answer, but I wanted to acknowledge the question and respond to it. There was that question about how the pandemic has or hasn't affected rates of, um, of trafficking. I don't know specific numbers off of the top of my head, but um, I do know, and, and we know that historically, um, rates of prostitution have remained constant, if not increased, during times of like turmoil or economic downturn. Um, so I would imagine that um, it's it's been going strong during the pandemic. I may be wrong about that, but um, and I'm sure there might be some numbers that, if not already out, are already out supporting that. Um, they will be soon. Um, but, you know, we've seen during the pandemic increased rates of domestic violence, um, increased rates of sexual abuse and assault of, of minors in the home because they're spending more time at home. Um, we've also seen a kind of a breakdown of support systems. One of the, um, one of the impacts of, of the pandemic and of sort of sheltering in place that has impacted young people, especially students, is the fact that by not being with their friends at like campus events, if they're in college or even in high school, outside of the home and away from parents or significant others or family more broadly, the, the rates of um, outcry for help have, have plummeted because people just don't find themselves in situations where they can sort of just say, hey, you know, this, this thing happened to me, which then like engages the support networks, right? So, um, I mean, I would imagine that the trafficking during the pandemic has, if not stayed steady it's it's even increased um particularly as, as gail's saying in the chat right there's more people are living in poverty and have fewer resources right if if trafficking is is um if one of the, the main kind of on ramps into the sex trade through which people are kind of coerced into it or drawn into it is 
lack of access to resources, poverty, survival, sex. Um, you know, we've seen those issues increase during the pandemic, right? Um, so I just wanted to sort of speak to that for a little bit. I also want to mention one thing, um, just in case it doesn't come, we don't get to sort of speak to it in conversation in a moment. I want to just acknowledge how great I think um, a lot of this information is being presented tonight is in terms of how it, it shows how the truth really runs counter to these, these um, widespread just cultural misconceptions about what trafficking is, right? I think when most people think of prostitution, they imagine street prostitution. And so I think that, you know, the seeing the map and the locations of storefronts, these are businesses in suburban areas, in strip malls, right? Um, that runs counter to what most people assume. And I also appreciate the, the time spent discussing that federal definition of trafficking. It's force, fraud, or coercion. Because I think that so often people picture force and then kind of ignore the other factors for trafficking as well, right? I think most of the time when people um, think of like popular media examples of trafficking, they think of like the Taken series, right? They imagine like a white girl who has gone on vacation in some other country and has been forcibly kidnapped, right? And while kidnapping absolutely does occur, you know, trafficking looks a lot of different ways and a lot of people who are being trafficked don't even know that they're being trafficked, right? Um, because we don't even know, you know, people who are even maybe ostensibly interested in the subject um, can't always totally articulate that definition. So I, I just love that, um, that, that we've spent some time sort of looking at the, the truth of it, right? So I want to speak for just a moment about what does this culture teach children? So in my role as an educator with CASE, um, I work in sexual violence prevention, which includes sexual exploitation, but also sexual harm more broadly, sexual assault, sexual harassment. Um, and so this, this question of, you know, what are we teaching children is of like central importance to me, right? So I wanna just sort of take us through some of these kind of lessons that kids get taught, uh, particularly, well, I think all kids get taught this, but particularly boys and young men uh, so I'll take us through this list and then kind of talk about some of the through connections and threads that tie them together. All right. So this will not come as a surprise to anybody, I don't think, but there is this really prevalent belief that masculine is strong and good and feminine is emotional and weak. There's the idea that things that are masculine are automatically good, automatically to be praised or valued. And things that are seen as being traditionally feminine are not right. Um, and that, sort of bridging the gap between these two things, especially for people who are otherwise masculine presenting, like men and boys and just masculine presenting people, to appear feminine at all or to be emotional at all is strongly discouraged, right? There's also the complete normalization of language that puts others down, devalues women, and is typically homophobic. Um, I think Mary was speaking earlier about words like, like the word bitch or don't be a pussy or you play like a girl. Um, or even be a man, man up, right? Again, we see that valuing of masculine and devaluing and degrading of feminine, right? On top of that, there's the attitude can do, which I think is definitely part of, um, someone asked what's the difference between hegemonic masculinity and toxic masculinity, right? Hegemonic masculinity, I think as Mary was saying, speaks to its role in our society. Whereas um, the toxicity part has to do with its effects on individuals, on both men and boys and on women. Um, so that it can do attitude results in a lot of violence being perpetrated, a lot of harm being self-inflicted, right? And on top of that, we see behavior that is tough and violent in nature being really encouraged, right, among boys and men. Um, you know, men are often taught not to express emotions at all, unless it's rage or anger, that's like the only one that's allowed. And then connected to that as well as um, sexual, sexually aggressive behavior is seen as being cool or even justified. I mean, how many times have we heard boys will be boys, right? Or, or oh, that's just locker room talk, right? These things are, are seen as not just like good and cool, but like central to what it means to be a man, right? So these are the kind of things that, that, are, that are sort of in, in my head and in, in the sort of minds of the organization I work for case as we are planning and conducting these education programs for young boys and young men um, to try to get out in front of these issues and sort of counteract what this culture is teaching children. So there's just a couple things I wanna say about this. One is that when we say this culture, we mean this culture, 
the culture we are all a part of, right? And the thing about culture is that it is enacted every day through the permissions and allowances and even encouragement of everyday folks, right? We are all participating in the culture. And I think that that message being sort of conveyed to young people, especially boys and young men is fundamentally important. This isn't a matter of like, well, there are some bad men over there who are doing the bad things, but you know, not all men, right? Um, I think it's a very common belief, but you know, the point isn't about can we pick out who are the bad men and sort of separate ourselves from them, from them as the good men. The point is to consider what is the, the collective socialization of manhood that is allowing these behaviors to, to persist, allowing violence to, to happen to be perpetrated in our presence and you know, just um, normalizing these things, right? These ideas that we see in this list didn't spring spontaneously into the minds of, of random men out there in the world, like out of nowhere, right? These are ideas that boys and men have been brought up being taught are, are true and okay, right? From, from birth, these, these ideas about gender and, um, and about masculinity and about femininity are being like drilled into people's heads. I mean, it even starts before birth, right? People are so kind of like gender binary obsessed that um, people are burning down forests with, with gender reveal parties, right? Um, it's, it's sort of all consuming. So the first thing we wanna do through educating youth, youth is to sort of get out in front of this and sort of show some counter ideas and kind of like augment what this culture is teaching children. Uh, something else I wanna just note real quick is that um, a lot of the time when it comes to hegemonic masculinity, a lot of this like violence and aggressive behavior and derogatory language is really at its core is about distancing. What hegemonic masculinity asks men to do is distance themselves from the feminine, distance themselves from non-hegemonic representations of masculinity, like trans masculinities, queer masculinities, are sort of othered and pushed away, right? Um, on top of that, men he under hegemonic masculinity are kind of demanded to distance themselves from their peers and not showing compassion, not showing like love in, in male friendships, right? Um, men are sort of encouraged to distance themselves from their own emotions and their own interests. The most common response a guy will get from his group of guy friends if he does something like join a feminism club at school or take a women's, women and gender studies class is, oh, there are a lot of hot girls there. Like, like interests have to be sort of filtered through this, this moving through the world looking for sex, right? That's like the only way that, that they're allowed to be valued under hegemonic masculinity. Um, and also I think something that's important to note is that and this has been discussed um, before when I saw Gail in the, in the chat talking about this, but there is this link between masculinity and sex and sex and power that is so like drilled into our heads that to really be a man, it means wanting sex all the time and, and going after sex and getting sex and sex, 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 and, and the way that sex needs to be and how it needs to look needs to be an expression of power and control over the person a man is having sex with. Uh, and some of the research we've done at Case, it shows that um, with buyers of sex, frequent buyers of sex and uh, like hobbyists, mongers, um, is that 20% of them first bought sex to mark some sort of like rite of passage into manhood, whether it was like an 18th or 21st birthday or like a bachelor party, right? So sex is, and, and in this case, purchased sex is so majorly connected to the idea of being or becoming a man, right? And in those cases, often it's with like a family member, like an uncle or a brother or a father, right? So not only is this, this stuff happening within friend circles, it's, it's how people are learning to be in their family lives, right? So I know this is a lot and we've been kind of like throwing a bunch at you all talking about um, just really kind of like trying to like diagnose these problems, right? And look at where they're coming from. But I think we wanna just move forward and maybe I think turn it back to you all to help us come up with some ideas. So, Can I add on one thing that was kind yeah. of funny? Yeah. Um, add to what you were saying, Ryan, nice, and nicely said, thank you. Um, during the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was put in isolation, you couldn't get out, it did slow down the sex trade and the pimps were complaining about it because they couldn't sell these poor girls. And I think probably, I don't know, if, how the poor girls were feeling about it, but the pimps were distressed. Well, that's true because remember, as we've talked about before um, uh, with these uh, 
presentations that, you know, with no Super Bowl or reduced uh, large events, uh, girls are not being, you know, brought in by plane to New Orleans or whatever for a week. And so I mean, think about the lost revenue that they're that that's where they're thinking from. Right. The lost revenue. Yeah. But it was the buyers that weren't buying. <laughs> yeah, they weren't, around, right? they, 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 weren't, they weren't yeah. making their trips. So, I mean, Ryan's point is in the, you know, few minutes that we have left is, so, you know, you're probably thinking, what do we do about this? I mean, uh, you saw a performance, outstanding performance by uh, Jamise to really bring it home. And uh, Mary gave us this great graphic uh, from Albert Einstein saying that, you know, the world, the world's a dangerous place, but not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything, the people who don't do anything about this evil. And one of the things that we try to do at JCAST is uh, nudge you a little bit and give you opportunities to do something about this. Marion Hatcher has a great way of thinking about it. She, she was uh, in the trade, got herself out. And she now works for Tom Dart, who's our wonderful Cook County Sheriff, who goes around the country trying to um, actually do stings at Super Bowls and things like that. But the point is, if you if you end the demand, and we've talked about this as an economic issue, then there's no impetus for for the traffickers and the pimps to supply the women. So it's really about demand. So how do you how do we work on this? And, and what are some things that you're willing to do uh, as you think about this? We, we talk about the educating, right? You're doing that now. It's also important for you to educate your family, your colleagues. When something comes up, make sure you're comfortable uh, bringing something up or saying, gee, would you like to learn more about this? Listen for, like Ryan was saying, talk about the locker room talk, listen for how people objectify other people in any kind of conversation. It doesn't have to be about sex trafficking. It's about the culture. How do we shift the culture and the conversation around uh, how we treat each other and how um, we deal with uh, these power issues? And then, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, one of the things we talk about is being an ambassador to your organizations and your synagogues and going to your your civic leadership and saying, hey, is this in our schools? You know, can we bring Ryan and Case in to do some presentations? Uh, yeah, I'm sure he'd like that. And uh, how do how can we shift things just a little bit? Because you can create change with very small actions. Why not if if you're all still there and and um thinking about this, put something in the chat that you're willing to do. Are you willing to do what we call as, uh, you know, put the hotline number in your phone so that if it comes up with someone, you can say, hey, here's the hotline. Or you see somebody in a store being treated poorly and you have some concerns about what's going on. Can you slip that girl the hotline number? Um, so the other thing that we talk about in terms of policy change is becoming what we call an NCJW witness slip warrior. How many of you have ever gotten, are you on our email lists to sign the, the witness slips uh, for Illinois and uh, for Springfield? So that when there are requests, a bill comes up to do something about uh, the domestic violence situation or uh, sexual assault, or even now, um, I'm just hearing lately about sexual assault in the military, which we didn't even touch, right? Um, that you would be willing to do that. And so you can, you can sign up uh, to get those. So what are some things that you're willing to do? Is stick those in a chat. Are you willing to go talk to somebody, your family? What's the hotline number? The hotline number is 888-373-7888. And I think somebody just put it in the, uh, yeah, so if you want to uh, um, send a note to Jill at JLux here at Yahoo, if you want to sign up for the Witness Slip Warrior program. And while you're thinking about it, we have some um, other questions. What's, what, yeah, for Illinois, what, what are one or two words that you're thinking about now at, after you've seen the performance and heard from Mary and Ryan about uh, 
male buyers and sex trafficking. How, what have you learned? This has been a surprise. What are a couple of words that, that you'd be willing to share about what you've thought about? And if you have any questions, feel free to um, unmute yourself and ask them. Did we freak you all out? I can't see. You. Are you all still there? <laughs> we scared them. So, um, yeah, so, and then there's the plea to donate if you like, because uh, the theater isn't free and Ryan is an employee. Uh, uh, Gail is a staff of JCAST and uh, we appreciate any donations that you make, any questions that you ask, feel free. I will take this off of sharing so you can all see each other and ask some questions. And then right before we're done, Debbie's going to tell you what's, uh, what's coming up. Yeah, talk to others, try to change their minds or at least share with them some, some of the statistics, right? Even statistics can be very useful for people sometimes. Can yeah. I? Throw in a quick plug. Yeah, 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 sure. Put in a plug and then it sounded like Gloria had a question. Okay. Uh, we actually got a date today for Mia. Um, where have all the young girls gone? And it's going to open, what is the date? April, uh, no, it's March 21st through April 24th. And, so let's, and get, let's get together and maybe we can do an event or something and, uh, uh, and go see it. Uh, I think that would be great. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Gloria, you had a question. I'm not sure I heard anything specific and how, what do we do to help end the demand? I mean, to me, that's paramount. Uh, Ryan, you want to go there? Who wants to go there? I'll be happy to. Okay. Oh, I, I, well, I, there's a number of things you can do. You can certainly raise, now that you know things, you can certainly raise awareness. Uh, you can recognize the signs. You can also teach those signs. Um, you can fundraise for anti-trafficking organizations. You've got three here right now uh, that you could help out. You can volunteer for anti-trafficking organizations. Um, you, could sit, you could promote anti-trafficking legislation. That's huge. Case is heavily involved with that. Uh, report human trafficking. Speak out on the social media. You can boy. A really effective one is boycott products and companies that are somehow supporting and involved with this. And that's um, largely how Backpage came into being disappearing because people collectively went after them. And now they went after Pornhub up in Canada. And I think they're having impact there too. You can I think contact also, also for, from our perspective, uh, reducing demand means helping young boys and men understand that this is not, a, so, this is not appropriate anymore and helping them shift their language. And so if you got grandchildren and grandsons, that's that's where we have to start. It's a generational issue, Stephanie. On, yeah, on the family level, you can certainly do that. Absolutely, Stephanie, you had a comment. So my question was like, based on the statistics that were shown, the buyers are pretty established. And so like, while I think it's wise and it's smart, I know it's being like a proactive measure to make sure we don't raise up another generation of men that think this is acceptable behavior like not saying stop going to high schools but is there a way that you could target um or speak i don't maybe not i don't know because they're men they're adults but like the only thing i can think of and not saying that this is a target location but like um a pipe fitting school like i, I live in riverdale illinois and so i don't know just like go to mainstream workplaces and talk to the stat, the men. And so even if there aren't men who are hobbyists, just having them have that, if they know of guys who, I can't even, I learned a lot of new words tonight, who <laughs> demonstrate that type of culture, um, they can share that. And, and then you have that peer, you know what I mean? And it's just- Absolutely. You're reaching- Training programs. Money to support this yeah. crime. Yeah, Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say just absolutely right because it's not like we've sort of talked about, it's not necessarily that like we need to go there and tell every man there, don't buy sex. I mean, I think we should say that anyway, but um, you know, what we can do is, is sort of activate these groups of, of men, whether they're like in my case, I just happen to work with high schoolers, right? But we can activate 
groups of adult men and professionals to like just not put up with these attitudes and behaviors, right? And empower them to call out these um, dismissals of people's experiences, right? Sort of like the devaluing of people in prostitution and, and praising of people who are traffickers and pimps as like a positive thing, um, just sort of show men that it's okay to go against that grain and to push back and, and to call out their peers who are perpetrating harm, uh, if not directly, then sort of just by their allowances or their encouragement through things they say and do. I think absolutely. Yeah, yeah, even at the bachelor parties, right? Or, you know, if you think about things like I used to be in a sales organization or and, and when I was in corporate America, I would train salespeople in the 80s. And, you know, you get you get 20 guys in a room. What are they doing at night? We don't know, but they're off away from home. And so it it can be very um appealing for them and no one knows what they're doing. So how somewhere along the line, somebody needs to say, this is not appropriate and they don't wanna see any of this behavior. We don't see a lot of that in corporate America. And it's that same, if they can do, you know, gender training or quality training, they can do the same type of training that Ryan's doing in the schools, the high schools. And it should definitely be in the, with the little ones where it starts, you know, I mean, all across the board that can be advocated. That's something you could do, Gloria. <laughs> Go so, advocate. We don't, yeah. we, we don't want to keep you past our, our 8.30 cutoff, but I can stick around. Maybe some of us can stick around. Maybe uh, Jamisa would really appreciate you having done that. And we are honored that you were the, you know, that was the first time you did that. I, I certainly would never have thought that. Uh, <laughs> Me either. At <laughs> all. Did so, that every night. Thank you. It was I terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. We should, we should get a charge in. for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was totally happy to do it. More than honored. I'm very Thank happy you. to do it. And thanks so much to Ryan and Case and Mary Bonnet. And we look forward to working with you both again. And um, that yeah, ends the program, but we're happy to stick around if you have more questions. Oh, and Debbie I, wants I, to I, tell I us. I want to yeah. do one thing. And especially since Mary announced her her dates, because this goes with our advocacy, advocacy in our arts program, which Yay. is, um, and we'll be talking, Mary, but um, we, because it's been on hiatus during uh, the pandemic, but we have, um, I have to read part of this, um, we're partnering with the Red Orchid Theater in the presentation of Excel Erita's audio play, Last Harmonious. It's a story of two brothers, Miguel and Julio, who are fleeing in America where being Latinx means imprisonment or death. It's a story of trust, love, loss, and the future of America. I listened to it today. It's really an interesting experience where you're imagining the stage play by just hearing it. Um, I will give you one warning. There is some X-rated, language and images, but um, it's very thought provoking. And on May 13th, we'll have Larry Grimm, who is a Chicagoland actor and the playwright do a talk back with us. So you can register for this at ncjwcns slash events. Um, you'll have like a week or you have through the 16th of May to listen to it at whenever you can, but you'll get access to that and you can attend the, the um, talk back. We are charging for this um, $18 so we can sort of support the uh, theater community and our advocacy and the arts programming so we can have more of it in the coming year. So we're sort of excited about it. So um, I hope some of you can join us. Thank you. And thank you all so much. Yes, thanks everyone, that was great.